Hey, good morning. I'm unable to start any video. I neither am I. I don't know if Brandon or Marilee or what, but it's still enabled by the host. Working on it, just give us a second. How come? Is anyone able to start their screens now? Or their cameras, I should say. There you go. Yes, sir. Do y'all see me? Because I don't see me. We can see you, Jill. Oh, hi. Okay. So if everybody, I think everyone has their okay, screen. Okay, y'all can more. see me. So, Mike, it looks like you do have a forum. Yay. Yay. All right. Good morning, everybody. Um, sorry for the uh, delay technical issue this morning. Um, Welcome everybody, and uh, I'm jump right along because it's uh, 12:05 already. Um, Please call the meeting to order, and um, we'll jump on into the January uh, meeting summary approval of the meeting summary for January. If everybody could take a look at that. And if everybody's had a chance to review it, I'd accept a motion from the floor to approve it. Mike, it's Kim Bazile. I'll make a motion to approve the minutes. Hi, Kim. Glad you could uh, join us today. Uh, so we have a motion on the floor 
to approve the minutes from Kim. Do we have a second or do we have any objections? If we have no objections, we'll let the motion carry and the meeting summary is approved. Um, next, we'll move on to the non contractual. Let me go back to uh, to some meeting guidelines. Um, of course, committee members, you're present when you have your cameras on and your name's showing. Uh, please keep your microphones muted unless you're called on by the chairperson. You can electronically raise your hand to request to speak and wait to be called on. Uh, attendees, once you're recognized to speak by the chair, your microphone will be turned on. After speaking, the microphone will be returned to mute. Um, just a little housekeeping that I jumped ahead of. So um, back to the non-contractual updates. Uh, first thing on the agenda is the, uh, I think we're gonna jump to Jen due to time constrictions on their end. So Jen, are you available? Hi, yeah, um, sorry. Um, hold on, let me put on my camera. I just realized it's not on, <clears throat> apologies. So um, specifically, I'm going to the, which one would you like me to take first? The 421 update or another item? Uh, 421, please. Okay, you bet. Um, hi, everyone. Um, so for Act 421, Children's Medicaid Option, this is our TEFRA-like program in Medicaid that we've been trying to get off the ground for a while now. Um, our, yep, and there's our website. How, thanks for sharing. <laughs> Um, so this is our website, and this is where we will be posting all updates and the registration whenever we do get approval for it to launch. So right now, where it stands is still with our federal partners at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, or CMS. Um, we have been in constant contact with them. In fact, I emailed them just Friday with another um, submission requirement that they have, and uh, also... They emailed me this morning to confirm receipt. I have requested them to give us a status update on our approval. They do not have a timeline yet. They said it's still undergoing their internal review. So I'm unfortunately, I don't have a timeline for when we will be able to launch because it does require that federal approval before we can open it up for people to register and enroll. Um, so as soon as I get more information from them, I will let y'all know um, and we will post it on our website. Our plan is that once we get indication of approval, we will have a, um, a, an initial registration period of a month and that will be announced through many different pathways. We'll do a press release, we'll put it on our website, we'll send out emails to you and all of our stakeholder groups. Um, we will push the messaging out in as many different pathways as we can. We'll put it on our social media um, so just continue to look at those um, places like our, our Medicaid Facebook page or our website um, for those announcements as they come. And um, once we get that approval, we'll be able to push out the announcement to start the uh, registration. Um, and once we get through the registration period, then we'll be able to start processing um, the, the requests for services so that we can send out uh, service offers and people can start applying for Medicaid um, for this program. So that, that's the plan. Uh, uh, Any questions on implementation? Um, Christina has her hand raised in the chat. Go ahead, Christina. Hey, can you guys hear me? Yes. Uh, my my commentary is in regards to partners. I saw it was on the agenda. I can wait. Oh, okay. Okay, please. We'll uh, uh, just raise your hand again when we get to the uh, partners. Sure. Thank you. And for those who've been tracking the budget, um, I just want to let y'all know that this program Act 421 is still in the FY22 budget request for Medicaid at 
excuse me, at a total annual appropriation of 27.2 million. So that has not changed from our previous uh, update. So. Okay, um, Matthew, did you have your hand up? Well, well, I had it momentarily up, Michael, and then I, I lowered it. I, I, Jen, I know this may be just an elementary question, so I apologize if you, could you just give a just sort of a, a, a brief overview? I did see it's for uh, 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 individuals with developmental disabilities under the age of 19, but Actually, I don't know, what can these services be used for? And I don't want you to go into too much detail if you've already done this already. Um, yeah. it no, just, it's okay. okay. I do want to make a clarification, though. It's not for individuals with developmental disabilities under 19. It's for individuals with disabilities. Um, so it's more comprehensive than that. Um, so very quick overview of what um, a TAFRA or TAFRA-like program encompasses. And we named ours Act 421 Children's Medicaid Option after stakeholder feedback on some naming ideas because it's not technically TAFRA um, and we wanna make that very clear. Um, it is a TAFRA-like program. Um, and so what these programs offer is an access to Medicaid. So a door to Medicaid for individuals who have a disability, who are under the age of 19, um, who would otherwise not qualify for Medicaid because of their parental income. Um, so because of this program, they can gain access to Medicaid services and their parental income is disregarded. Um, so basically only the income of the child is counted. Um, and that is because they qualify based on other disability requirements. So either they have a developmental disability and they meet that um, intermediate care facility level of care, um, or maybe they have a physical or mental disability that um, helps them to qualify for nursing facility level of care or hospital level of care. And um, we have an assessment process for all of those institutional levels of care that are prerequisites for um, gaining eligibility into this program. Um, we worked on those, on those level of care requirements with our stakeholder group. And um, what it boils down to is if the person is pursuing the developmental disabilities pathway, they will go through the normal process they do today as if they were applying for a waiver um, they have to get a statement of approval for the dis developmental disability, and then um, they fill out a, um, they get their doctor to complete the form 90L, which certifies that they meet that intermediate care facility level of care. Um, if they're going the other pathway for um, physical or mental disability, where they um, might meet a nursing facility or a hospital level of care, then we have an assessment that's performed by a registered nurse. And um, all of that is done through the local governing entity, so the human service districts and authorities. Um, and all that's kind of routed through the same place so that families who are more accustomed maybe to the developmental disabilities um, process um, don't have to go anywhere new. It, it all goes through the local governing entities now. And so we've decided to have that be the point of entry for this program as well to make it a little easier. Um, and again, I want to reiterate this, this is not a home and community based services waiver, there are no extra services, no home and community based services. Um, it is simply a door to access the core benefits and services in Medicaid. So um, that is how we built it. And it will be in managed care. So I do want to reiterate that for families who are not familiar with managed care, this program is a um, mandatory managed care program for cost savings. And I think there was something in the chat from Hyacinth. Oh, okay. Nope, not about me. Any um, other questions on Act 421? Okay. Thank you, Jennifer. Sure. Did you want me to touch on the budget, Michael? Was that for me too? Sorry, Mike, you do have a, or we did have a hand raised. I don't know if it went down. Uh, I believe Jamie Dawson has hand raised. Oh. Go ahead, Jamie. Hi, can y'all hear me? Yeah. Okay, um, I just had a quick question um, about the act. My son currently has, well, he was able to obtain Medicaid under the waiver we received a year or so ago. 
believe. But the Medicaid he has is some type of Medicaid that we don't even uh, qualify for many things. Um, so should I reapply for this whenever it become like to get full access to Medicaid? Because right now he we're lim very, very limited. Hi, Jamie. Um, thanks for your question. And I'd love to get your information offline so we can help you. Um, but um, to, the short answer to the question is, if you otherwise qualify for Medicaid, you will not qualify for Act 421. It is the way we've designed the program. It is um, in our hierarchy of eligibility. It is at the um, last stop. So if you qualify for Medicaid in any other full benefit program, then you okay. won't qualify under Act 421, unfortunately. Um, and that's okay. because we wanna make sure that the um, people who do get Medicaid through other programs don't um, utilize the services under Act 421 for those who have been waiting for Medicaid. Yeah. And I, I think the question you have about the limited Medicaid, if you're in a waiver, if you're yeah. in a developmental disabilities waiver, um, Julie, correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is that anyone in a waiver gets full Medicaid coverage, right? Yeah, because mine doesn't. Accurate. Okay, and so I, yeah, I definitely need some help then. Please <laughs> Thank you. send us your information. We would like to help you. Yes, yes, ma'am. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Liz has her hand raised. Ms. Gary, you have the floor. Thank you, Mike. Um, I just wanted to state when I heard Jamie talking, I'm guessing that she might have a behavioral health card and does not possibly have the either managed care card or the legacy card. And that's what's confusing because I've been talking to a lot of families recently who are having that same situation and don't realize that the behavioral health is not their actual Medicaid card. So I just uh. wanted to throw that in because that could be part of the box. Thanks, Liz. We'll definitely circle with Jamie offline. That could be it, but in case it's not, we'll definitely get with her um, to figure awesome. it out. Thanks, Thanks Jen. For that Thanks, uh, Mike. heads up, we might need to send out some messaging to families anyway if they're if they're running into that issue. Yeah, Jen, it really has become a big issue, and I didn't realize it until I saw some stuff going back and forth on Facebook that okay. families are not realizing, one, that the behavioral health card is not their full Medicaid card, and two, a lot of them don't even have a full Medicaid card because either, one, their legacy, mostly because their legacy, and their, if they're managed care, they mostly have it, but some don't even know, realize why they have two cards. So there's definitely some more uh, possible uh, information that needs to be out to families. Okay, Thanks. we'll definitely work on, on some messaging there. And we have, um, there should be a, a fee-for-service or legacy Medicaid card that families get. So I'm gonna check on that too. Thank you. Okay. Is there another question? I thought I saw maybe a hand raised. I believe that's all. Um, Jen, did you say you were gonna cover the budget or? Was Julie. I'll, I'll definitely kick it off, but I think Julie has a couple things too. Um, so generally speaking, um, the Medicaid budget for FY22 um, this year going through session, it's intact. Um, so due to the COVID public health emergency, um, we have received um, federal funding, uh, additional federal funding um, due to the public health emergency, and that has allowed us to keep current services intact. Um, however, um, what, what it also has allowed the state to do was make other agencies whole that were having a shortage um, due to the public health emergency and running into some revenue problems. And so what that means is we have not been able to fund a lot of additional things like we would otherwise hope for with the enhanced federal dollars that we've received. Um, those dollars are, are important to the state to keep it afloat and to keep it, it running um, for all benefits and services. So um, if you run into some of those issues, that might be why I just thought it might be helpful to understand that context um, that basically the Medicaid program is helping, um, is helping the whole state. Um, and so, um, I don't want y'all to, um, I also wanted to just clearly state that right now um, we don't have any major cuts and um, we'll be watching that very closely. 
And I think that's my overview from a high level. Julie, um, was, was there anything else from the OCDD side? Um, just to reinforce what you said, there's no reductions in our home and community-based waivers. There is some discussion um, happening now. Um, it'll have to play its way out through the legislative process, though, about potentially some additional funds to help support people with intellectual and developmental disabilities receive dental services. Um, so we are not sure what that's going to look like, but that is something we're closely watching. There are talking about trying to find some additional funds to cover. Um, uh, one is children who need uh, to receive anesthesia for dental services and needing to take a look at that. And the other is looking at being able to have comprehensive dental services for adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities. So we're uh, closely working with uh, Representative Butler and um, there was an OCDD, our state advisory council developed a task force and that task force is what's been helping provide information related to that. So we don't really have a, a final of what that'll look like, but we do know that there's um, conversation happening during the session right now about that. Um, and then on the, uh, the only other thing I'll add on the, on the kind of federal uh, budget side of things that we've gotten a lot of questions about, there is um, in the American Rescue Act, there was an enhanced a 10% enhanced federal match for home and community-based services. Um, have gotten a lot of questions and a lot of suggestions from folks about, um, and we're happy to, to, to take those thoughts and suggestions, but we are still waiting for CMS to send us some guidance on what things we can and can't spend that additional match, those additional match dollars on. Um, there was a CMS um, call last week with states um, and basically they said, we know you guys all want this uh, and we're working to get guidance out as soon as possible. So while we are hearing from folks and getting to gathering suggestions on for things, we will have to wait and see what that technical guidance is from CMS before we can come up with a final plan um, in the department for what we would be able to do uh, with those additional um, enhanced match, potentially enhanced match dollars. So that's all I'll share kind of more specific in the DD side. Oh, and also- And Jen, was, feel free to correct anything I said that was wrong. That's 100% correct. Um, and I'm glad you remembered about the, the ARPA um, adjustment because that was important. The other thing I just wanted to mention for folks who are not aware that the public health emergency was extended today. Um, yeah. <laughs> Um, so it was set to expire tomorrow. So um, the Biden administration has extended it another 90 days. We fully expected that. That's not really a surprise, but we just wanted to let you know it did officially get extended. Um, and um, the Biden administration has informed us that it is likely, although not promised, that they will continue to extend it through the end of this calendar year. So we just watch to see how that unfolds because it must be renewed every 90 days per federal law. So um, if they want to continue it, I mean, so we're watching that, but it did get extended um, today. So we'll have another 90 days. That's good news. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so Julie, do you have uh, anything else for us today? Mike, I have one more thing. I'm sorry. I did just oh, want sure. to use this time to plug. So for those who are not, because I don't think we've met um, since we restarted this, but um, we have to, in Medicaid, start getting our eligibility processes running again um, for in preparation of when the public health emergency will end. Um, and so in order to do that, we have restarted the renewal process. Many of you might be starting to get mail outs from us about your renewals um, and renewal packages um, with some pre-filled forms to verify. Um, so I wanted to let you know that that, that is um, correct. We are starting to send those out again. Um, however, if someone is not eligible or if they don't respond or if um, information they provide shows us that they no longer qualify for Medicaid, we're, we're not disenrolling right now. We're still maintaining all eligibility due to the requirements of the Families First Coronavirus Response Act. 
um, which says that we cannot disenroll anyone who was eligible as of March 18, 2020. So we're maintaining that eligibility. There's only a few limited exceptions to that rule. Um, some of the exceptions include if the person moves out of state, if they pass away, or if they request closure, and also um, if the enrollment was due to an error, um, we can disenroll. So there's a few exceptions. There's also, um, we're also now allowed to move people between programs. So I wanted to let you know that, that you may be seeing some eligibility changes if we see that you now qualify for um, a different program like the Medicare Savings Program. That's a change from previously for us. So you're basically the whole point of this is just to let you know you're going to start to see more eligibility traffic through the mail from Medicaid. So please, please pay attention to your mail and please help other people know to pay attention to their mail. We're trying to push out some communications campaigns around that and redo the check your mail campaign now that we're kickstarting that off again. Um, so please help us spread the word because we don't want anyone to, uh, to miss an important letter that affects their eligibility in the long term. Okay, um, Matthew has his hand raised. Yeah, yeah thanks, Michael. Uh, Jen and Julie, thank you so much for the update. And it's uh, both a question and, a, and um, sort of a comment. Uh, on the question side, Julie, you mentioned the 10% FMAP bump that was recently passed in Congress, um, and y'all are waiting on CMS guidelines, um, and hopefully those come quick. My question to you, will that take legislative approval in order to, assuming those guidelines are favorable and y'all can do some things with the, the funding, will it require legislative approval? And then that, that was my question. So do we have to wait till July, perhaps, uh, 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 to utilize those funds? And then the next thing is, um, I know the Community Provider Association, as well as the ARC of Louisiana and the Support of Independent Living Network, uh, as well as the DD Council last year, you know, are trying to seek additional funding for rate reimbursement. Uh, we are absolutely uh, just a situational awareness struggling with finding uh, field workers or direct support workers uh, in the community, um, particularly in the Baton Rouge and Lake Charles regions. I, I would say those regions in particular are extremely, extremely difficult. So that was my, my point to you is, um, um, does it require legislative approval to use those funds? Um, and, and I just wanted to let you know the difficulty we're having with finding labor uh, currently. Yeah, and, and Julie, um, let's tag team this one. I can say for your first question, Matthew, the 10% um, home and community-based FMAP increase, it's kind of, first I'll say it depends on what CMS guidance says and comes out on what we can or can't do because it's, it's not allowed to supplant current services. Um, the only thing we've seen so far is that it, it can't supplant current services. Um, so we, there's a lot of guidance we need. Um, depending on what we get out of that, I would say um, most of our um, coverage and services in Medicaid can be done internally without legislative action, but that's not to say that all of them can be done without legislative action. That's the only reason I have that caveat. Um, so if it was um, a new benefit or service, nine times out of 10, we can do that in Medicaid through our rulemaking and waiver process, but there are always exceptions where we would require legislation. And so then we would run into some barriers um, on the budget side, however, I, if, since it's an FMAP increase, um, we could, it would require legislative action to increase the budget authority on our federal line, probably if we don't have enough already there. And if that does happen, um, that will either be a budget adjustment, a BA7 through our, the Joint Legislative Committee on the Budget, or we could settle up through the Supplemental Appropriations Act at the end of next year. Um, so there's, I just want, I just say that to tell you that we could um, find a pathway to adjust our federal financing if, um, if it was found that we didn't have enough authority already in our budget. Um, but uh, there's multiple ways to do it. Um, but the, the part about the services, it really just depends on the CMS guidance, whether we would need like a 
a bill or something like that. And so that's why we're very anxious to get that CMS guidance very quickly. Before we go on to the, the, the DSW, the rate issue, Julia, did, you, did, I, did I misstate anything? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, and actually, I'm going defer to defer to Julia on the other piece because I think she has a lot more knowledge than I do. <laughs> yeah, the only thing I'll add, and, and um, I was going to talk briefly about the listening sessions that we had. And, and so, um, I, I mean, I, we've heard, you know, Matt, from a lot of folks that just kind of one of those requests be in some way that we could help if there would be a way to use those funds to help uh, with the direct support workforce uh, shortage area. We've definitely heard that feedback from uh, families and, and providers alike. Um, and a lot of discussion too about how we make sure that that goes to the direct support workers. And so um, we, we have heard that uh, regularly um, and we've had started internal conversations about what that may or may not look like again We'll have to get the technical guidance to see exactly what it says, but we have started our, our internal conversations about, um, you know, what some things we might want to propose, um, you know, that as well as other, you know, we, what, depending on kind of how much money it is, depending on how much, what the, what the guidelines say, we have some, you know, some different ideas about things that um, might potentially be helpful to the service delivery system. But we will definitely continue to have more opportunities to hear from folks, you know, as, as we get the that feedback from CMS. Well, Julie, thank you very the much. Thing, the other thing quickly, Matt, you know, I don't know how much you guys pay attention to the federal legislation, but I can say that President Biden has mm -hmm. said that he wants to have an infusion of federal funds specifically for the direct support workforce. He has listed the workforce challenges as one of his major initiatives, you know, in his first hundred days. So um, I don't have a lot more about that, but I know that in through my national um, state DD director work group, there's been a lot of conversation about the Biden administration trying to make sure that there's um, states have access to funding to help with that workforce, uh, those workforce strategies. Um, so we're, we're paying close attention to that. There's a few, there's some different le federal legislation out there that's being batted around. I haven't seen anything specifically filed yet, but I've heard of some on the horizon potentially to help with that workforce. Uh, so we'll be keeping a close eye on that. Thank you, Julie. Do we have any other questions for Julie or Jen? Mike, do you want me to provide my other updates on the oh. under the non-contractual update? Oh yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. Feel free. Go That's ahead. okay. So we did kind of along those lines, the COVID-19 and the waiver updates. We held two listening sessions um, last week. We had um, about 200 people on our provider-oriented call, and over 430 people on our um, family and advocate call. So we were really, really excited and got a lot of very positive feedback about those listening sessions. Um, we gave some information about the flexibilities and or exceptions we've had in place during COVID, um, you know, shared some information with folks, and then just really took the for used a forum and it's something we CMS has done recently just sort of opened it up and uh, um, asked families to share with us you know what worked about the exceptions and flexibilities recommendations or thoughts that that they might have um, it again was very very positively received uh, got several emails afterwards saying that families felt like they had a voice and that people in Baton Rouge were you know listening even if we can't do everything exactly, because, you know, we might have one person who says, I think I need to do it this way. And another who says, no, I think I need to do it this way. But taking all that into consideration, we really have listened to people. We are still kind of getting some suggestions in through our OCDD info at la.gov email address. And we're compiling those. And then internally, we'll be having discussions um, of exactly where we want to go, how we want to move forward. And that means making any waiver yeah, amendment yeah, changes. Yeah. And so we'll be laying those out right? and I will be sharing those once we do have our kind of our final decision about that. But 
very, very positive. And thanks for any of you who participated. I think the, the format is definitely one we will look at using again in the future, um, especially as we continue to get our technical uh, skills down a little bit better in terms of, of, of running webinars. So our next steps, again, will be that we'll be moving forward with making some waiver changes. I'm not prepared today to say exactly what those are, um, but of most, you know, a high importance to people where having family members in some way or another continue to be paid caregivers. Um, uh, that was probably the one that we heard the most about. Um, but we also, um, you know, heard some on, on, on other um, areas as well, things like the virtual visits and whatnot. Um, and so we will be, like I said, putting together those, the, all those suggestions and then the feedback in terms of where we go next. Um, hey, Julie. The other, uh-huh. Hey, this is Brenton. Uh, I, I know that Representative Turner has a bill out there. Um, I, I didn't know if y'all have been in any, con had any conversations about that piece of legislation. Um, House Bill 204. Uh -huh. Yeah. I, I wasn't sure if the, if, if y'all had been having those conversations with it, because I know it would I guess, legislatively extend some of these exceptions permanently or make them permanent. So I, I didn't know if the department has been in having conversations with Representative Turner, if y'all were involved with that or. We haven't yet. I think we have a meeting scheduled okay. tomorrow with him. Um, okay. I think it will be the first time we've met with him. Yeah. Okay. I know the provider association shared with me the, you know, that they plan to request that uh, the legislation. Got you. There's a comment. Okay. Any other questions on that? Tell a memo say that that meeting is tomorrow. Thank you, Jill. Any other questions? Um, just to, oh. Oh. moving to COVID nineteen. Just a just a quick update. Um, last we met, we were kind of just getting started on our vaccination efforts. So just to share with you guys an update, we now have uh, forty five percent of our waiver participants have been uh, vaccinated, which is an awesome number but we still have work to do. We still have about 17% who would like to be vaccinated and haven't been yet. And so we're working on helping make sure we can get them scheduled. Uh, different regions have different activities going on to help those that are homebound or can't get to a clinic to be able to get vaccinated. And we're seeing more uh, efforts there. So uh, just wanted to put uh, that plug there. That's for our participants. We've also been um, tracking our the folk, the provider numbers, and so for our provider agencies, this is statewide. For the provider agencies statewide, we're seeing that there's 21% of the direct support workforce has been um, vaccinated, um, and about 20% of our support coordinators have been vaccinated. So we're continuing to look at that and we look at it every couple of weeks by region to see where we might need to put more um, more efforts out. Now that it's open, it's pretty easy, you know, things have changed now that it's opened up. I think for a long time it was that we just didn't have enough supply and, and now uh, I think we don't have enough demand. So I think there's more su the supply is out, outdone the demand now. So it's fairly easy, I think, to get an appointment within a day or two some place pretty close by you. So we expect to continue to see those numbers increase um, pretty rapidly for folks who want uh, who want that. Um, and then the last thing I had on here uh, requesting an update on was the visual services work group update. So OCDD had um, put together a uh, visual uh, services work group. And I think some folks from DD Council are actually members on um, on our work group. So I wanna, you know, thanks to, to folks who participate in that. Um, where this work group came from was from a, from a suggestion from the Developmental Disabilities Council. We had done a 
sort of a, a graphic that helped to sh sort of walk people through uh, from the point of uh, receiving a waiver offer to the point of certification, or actually from the point of the sunscreening, I think. Um, and so we got some positive feedback on that and said it would be helpful if we had other um, kind of infographics to help explain the process, different processes within our developmental disabilities section. So we've put together a work group and that work group's been looking at nailing down kind of what are the most important services that we want to focus on first. We are working on uh, waiver services and working, taking a look at what we have out there on our website. I know a lot of times in DD council meetings, I hear from folks that they tried to go to the website and either it wasn't very user friendly or there was information there that was out of date or information there that was confusing. So we're really starting with waiver and trying to make sure that the information we have is Hi, pertinent, relevant, go. and useful uh, for folks and that it's in an easy to use uh, format. So we are, um, you know, moving forward uh, quickly, I think, on those things but also just trying to make sure that the, the documents are done in a manner that is uh, easy for uh, families to be able to read and navigate. Um, and so we are, um, we've got a timeline document, but that's where we are. That's really just kind of that, a broad level overview of that visual services work group. Um, and we'll have more to come and hopefully soon uh, changes to our OCDD website to make things more user friendly for families. So I'll stop there, but happy to take questions. Hey, Jill. Hey, whoever does it, hey. Julie. <laughs> oh, sorry, I wasn't paying attention. Um, do you guys have a summary of what that work group has been done, doing, has done, already achieved that we can maybe look at or you can Maybe email to me. Sure. Do you, uh, would the whole group be interested in that? I can send it either to, to Brenton and Michael for everybody or Jill, I can send it to you, whichever you guys prefer. That's up to, that's too much power for me. <laughs> Julie, why don't you send it to Brenton and he can distribute it and because okay. I know it's not technically one of our initiatives, but it's good to be in the know. No problem. I just sent it to Britain. Thank you. Thank ah. you, Mike. Yes, ma'am. Right, Thank you, Julie. Do we have any other questions for Julie? Okay, we're gonna um, move on to our contractual activities. Uh, first on the agenda is a review of the contractual updates. And we're gonna go to uh, Mary Lee, who's gonna start us off on partners uh, and policy making. So Mary Lee, you have the floor. Thank you, Mike. Good morning, everyone. Um, I am first going to update you guys on partners and policy making. That's our advocacy training. And this is activity 1.2.1. So the update on this is in your status report packet. The PIP ad hoc committee met in January, um, essentially just to receive updates on the PIP contracts, the one between the council and families helping families, and then between families helping families and the PIP coordinator. Uh, the PIP coordinator presented on the virtual accommodations and the need for that for the 2020 class to complete virtually. And then we reviewed um, ITAC's 
you know, ITEC disparities and guidance from ITEC regarding um, PIP alumni. And then that was the last meeting of the PIP ad hoc committee. Um, the a motion was made to dissolve that committee. And since then, the PIP coordinator has been preparing to implement the completion of the 2020 PIP class virtually and the 2021 PIP virtual sessions, which again is not um, a partners in policy making class. The people that complete 2021 sessions are not partners in policy making graduates. Um, and this is all outlined in recommendations that the PIP ad hoc committee gave to the executive committee and that, that, that they adopted. A couple of different drafts of proposed plans have been made for that. And then there was one meeting held in March. Um, and that is my update. I've asked Adrian Thomas, who is the PIP coordinator to be here today um, to give you guys more specifics on how she is implementing the 2020 class virtually and the 2021 sessions. Uh, Adrian, I think Haley promoted you to a panelist, so I'm not sure if you're ready. Can you hear me? I'm, I'm here. I hear you, so I think everybody can as well. I'm gonna <clears> let you know. Are you ready for me, um, Mr. Chair? Uh, yes, ma'am, go ahead, Adrian. Okay, um, for this quarter, January through March 2021, there was uh, three main focus areas for uh, partners in policy making. Number one was reacquainting the class of 2020. Of course, there was uh, basically after March of 2020, all communication was maybe more informal. Uh, the participants contacting each other so on February 13, 2021, the class had the opportunity to engage in an informal Zoom hour that was set up. And so they, um, that opportunity, and, and during that opportunity, um, I kind of, in, I introduced uh, ways that we would be moving forward. I took on some of the concerns uh, regarding uh, the virtual format. The second thing, the second focus was initiating conversations with speakers to discuss effective ways to carry out the virtual format. Many of the speakers that we had or that um, were speakers for past partner sessions and scheduled to present to the class of 2020 were uh, familiar with virtual formats uh, via webinar and lecture. Some have actually worked with other states uh, virtual. So they have uh, they had some input and some ideals and uh, recommendations. We also uh, looked at the questions concerning the guidelines for the national partners, um, and we I reached out to uh, the part the national partners and policy making representative and the objectives that were that she was mainly concerned about. We actually completed those objectives in January and March. Though we, uh, though it was recommended in the committee to do review and refresher for those activities. Uh, in addition, I've had informal discussion with other state coordinators on their virtual formats or what they are doing uh, moving forward. Uh, the last and third concern was addressing par participant needs and concerns virtually with the same enthusiasm and passion as we established in person. Many of the participants continue to express their desire to have an in-person pro program completion, but um, they are, uh, some actually, you know, are expressing their willing to try virtually to see how it works out. Their concerns are mainly focused on being able to concentrate without the regular home distractions, such as the same woes that they that their children may be experiencing with virtual learning, and uh, also we were a uh, we don't we obtain a don a donated computer for one of the participants. That was one of the needs that were 
uh, one of the concerns that was addressed. Uh, the, uh, there's a snapshot of the virtual session. I know you probably can't see it from here, but I have submitted it to Brenton uh, and Mary Lee for anyone who wants to see that snapshot. And basically it just states that the 16 to 20 hours that we're usually together in person on the weekends will be met through independent readings and activities, recorded lectures and interviews, live webinars. Each participant uh, will actually participate in some of the regional virtual activities with those focus areas of being political action, education opportunities, family support and engagement, and employment. We utilize the GroupMe platform for as a message board for reminders, announcements, and survey and evaluation polls. We use the Trello board for virtual classroom, for assignments, re resource and information links, and class discussion. Zoom is used for the live lectures and the official means of communication will be email for the virtual format. Are there any questions for me? Floor is open for questions. Um, I believe Christina, you had a question earlier. Go ahead, Christina. Hey, <clears throat> how are you guys? Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak today. I don't have any specific questions for Adrienne at this point. Um, I actually had just um, wanted to share something with you today, if that was okay. Um, I prepared something ahead of time because I've been planning on attending this meeting since uh, I had found out about the implementation of the ad hoc committee. And basically, um, I just felt that there had been, you know, uh, not very much communication um, to us partners, classmates about the ad hoc committee. In fact, none of us knew about it except for one classmate who apparently was invited to participate in that. And so I don't know if you guys have time today, but I did prepare something that I was hoping I could read. Uh, Christina, I can give you the floor for uh, two to three minutes. Sure, I'll make it brief as possible. Okay. Um, so basically, I do just want to start with a little quote by Jesse Jackson, and that is, inclusion is not a matter of political correctness, but it's the key to growth. So um, basically, I'm coming before you today selfishly and on behalf of my, my classmates of the 2020 class to ask you to allow us the opportunity to basically not go forward virtually, but to be the first class to be allowed to restart and continue in person when that is an option. Um, basically, like I said, uh, we, we really didn't know about the ad hoc committee. And as Adrian has gone ahead and stated that many of us, the majority of us all want to complete in person. It's going to be very difficult. Um, she mentioned children and their virtual learning, but for us parents, it's a little different, you know, um, we're not running up to our kids on virtual class. Like, Hey, can you get us a snack? Can you do this? Can you do that? Like kids don't have the responsibilities that, that we have. So that would be a little bit different in moving forward virtually. Um, that being said, I think we can all agree that COVID-19 has disproportionately, you know, affected the disability community community. But most notably for me are the adverse social impacts of the virus mitigation efforts. For example, when self-care is canceled, individuals with disabilities have to revert to relying on family supports if they're available, which has led to an increase in mental health issues and feelings of isolation or dependence. Our class, we got so close with one another. And honestly, I feel like I've done more with partners since COVID happened than I did in class. And that's saying a lot because I absolutely love the partner's experience and everybody that spoke to us when we were in class was amazing. Um, that being said, I just don't think that we were fairly represented. And I think that none, I personally, I don't have the enthusiasm to move forward in the way that Adrian has presented it to be virtually. Um, it seems like the enthusiasm is, enthusiasm is kind of like 
ran out on everybody's end. And so that's another reason why I think at this point, a year later, it, I really would just love if you guys would consider allowing us to be the next partners class and allow us to just restart this because the, the hands-on aspect of the program is very important. And um, I actually had consulted with Dr. Wick of the Minnesota Partners in Policymaking class and they had went forward, they took a break in April and went forward with their class. And they also opened up their 2021 class publicly as well with um, a flexible schedule. Ms. Wick had mentioned um, several safety protocols that they were able to follow while still having um, an excess of budget. So I would love if the council could consider um, allowing our classmates to have that opportunity. Thank you, Christina. Thank you. Lillian, you have a question? Yeah, I just had some input. So I think it's really, really important for us to listen to this PIP class, just because it seems like there's been a bit of a breakdown of communication because I know I've never heard these concerns directly from the PIP class before. And I know that as a council, we're very habitual and we like to do things the way they have always been done, right? But I think it's really, really important to listen to the needs of these participants because they're communicating with us that, hey, look, we're losing our enthusiasm and we're losing our passion. And I think the really beautiful thing about partners is that it ignites that passion that we need in advocates that's so necessary for advocacy. And if we're losing that, then it's not worth it. Then we're not spending our money well and we are not using our time well because partners is not having the intended impact. So I would just make the suggestion that we really take this seriously, um, not only for the PIP class, but for our relationship with the community in general, that our community feels heard by the council that's representing them. So thank you. Thank you, Lily. Mike, may I have the floor for a moment, please, sir? Yes, sir. Randall, go ahead. Um, hi, for everyone that doesn't know, I'm Randall Brown, the chair of the DD Council, and um, I'm here today as a member of this committee, but also as the um, chair of the council, I have the responsibility to make sure that all our activities are carried out as best can be carried out during this COVID uh, pandemic. So that's where the virtual side came in. Um, we want to provide everyone the opportunity to uh, continue. And so that's where that idea came from. And um, but I do hear you today and I'm going to reach out to Miss Wick with the uh, Minnesota program, which I who I believe were the first people to start partners uh, a very long time ago. So I will reach out um, to her and see what protocols they enacted and how and uh, how we might be able to um, look into ways we could um, accommodate some of what I hear here today. So please know you're heard and thank you for bringing uh, your concerns to our attention and um, I will be looking into it. Thank you. Thank you, Randall. Another hand raised. Christina, you have a question or comment? Yeah. Um, yeah, I just I I just wanted to thank you all very much for allowing me that opportunity because it's been something that has been on my mind for quite some time and my my classmates as well. And uh, many of them are actually tuned in today watching. And so we're seeing you guys hear us and it's very encouraging. And so thank you very much. Thank you. Adrian, do you have anything else to add before we move on? I'm all on. Uh, I'll just, I, I do have some information that I'll pass to Mary Lee uh, for Mr. Brown, who wants to reach out to um, Dr. Wick. 
uh, the information that she provided me for um, as a predecessor for his discussion with her. And um, I, um, I sent out an email today and I do, we do that uh, partners is better in person, but we do want to make sure that everyone is afforded the opportunity considering the time, the concerns of the time we're in now. Thank you very much. Um, Lillian, you have a question? Oh, so sorry. I just have a really, really quick suggestion. Maybe in order to kind of bridge that communication gap that we're seeing currently and that we have seen historically, maybe one thing, the one mitigation measure that we can utilize is possibly notifying the PIP class when there's a PIP committee meeting or even a self-determination inclusion committee, looping them into those, those email chains where they're aware of what's going on and the committees that are supposed to be representing them. Good point. Again, uh, Lillian, thank you for that suggestion. It's Randall again. Um, that's something we're already looking at doing and thank you very much for that suggestion. And just to make the public aware, every, th every meeting we do have is public and um, also every meeting we have is posted on our social media, usually a few days in advance of the meeting. So uh, please uh, follow our social media accounts and um, that will give you through social media the updates as quickly as we can for everyone. So, but there's certainly um, a suggestion to loop the partners class in on partners activities um, we have noted. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks again, Randall. Um, now I'd like to uh, go ahead and uh, move along. And um, Ebony, are you available to give us an update on your initiatives? Hey, Mike. Hey, yes, sir. Right. This is Brenton. Uh, I think there's another initiative, um, Activity 1.4.3, that Mary Lee covers. If we could let her cover that one, because I think she has a hard cut off uh, around two. So we just want to make sure we get to that initiative. Absolutely. Thank Mary you, sir. Lee, uh, you can go ahead. Thank you, Brenton and Mike. Um, and I just wanted to say before I went to the next initiative, thank you, Christina, for coming to this meeting. Um, I, I, I heard your comments and I appreciate them. Um, and I'm happy to move, I mean, support the council in whichever direction that, that they decide to do the partners class. Um, I do want to say the ad hoc committee um, was created at, at this committee. This is the SDCI committee, Self-Determination Community Inclusion Committee. So it meets quarterly, um, usually a couple days before the full council meeting. And this is the committee where partners and policymaking updates happen. Um, and this is the committee where the partners and policymaking ad hoc committee was created. It was just created in a meeting similar to this. And it, the floor was just open to anyone who wanted to join. Um, so it's unfortunate that more, more of the partners participants weren't, weren't aware and, and weren't on it. But I just did want to clarify that um, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not aware that anybody reached out specifically to one partners person to represent the partners class. Um, so my next initiative is the videos and, um, I have a little update I'll give you guys. And again, the full update is in your status reports in that big packet that you get. This is activity 1.4.3. So O'Neill Communications, um, cr has created a schedule in the last quarter. They began their outreach to speakers. They conducted interviews virtually and they began producing videos. Um, the videos were sent to the council staff for review and edits. And then once approved, they were sent for captioning and uploaded to our YouTube channel and our Facebook with also with corresponding social media posts. Um, and we did those on select Fridays 
as a part of, we made the campaign hashtag fully included Friday. And this was presented um, at the last SDCI committee meeting, that plan and, and things like that. Um, the, they also launched a PR that went out to 521 outlets in all of our regions in Louisiana. And um, KPLC and Lake Charles actually picked it up and did a story on it. And so far we have had two videos um, produced and released. The first one was Meet the Council. And that one was March 26th. And then the second one was Advocating for What's Important. And that's um, released April 9th. And there's a whole series of videos. Um, I can read them to you guys if you would like, but they're in your status report. And I'm not sure if there's any questions on that. I have one question. Uh, Hyacinth, you have the floor. Yeah, good day, Mr. Chair. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Got a question on the Meet the Council video. Have we made any adjustments to the video as it relates to make sure that there is a diverse population of people that are represented in the video? Have we made those adjustments yet? So the Meet the Council was the first video. Um, it was diverse in terms of the type of advocates and the regions and representatives versus um, parents and, and self-advocates. I do know that you had a concern about the racial, specifically the racial diversity. And Courtney, our interim executive director and I did meet with the contractor and she ultimately decided to sort of do a part two. Um, the, the person, we reached out to different people um, of different racial backgrounds and just the way it fell, someone didn't fall in that video. Um, but we did have a person that was in another video and they're just gonna kind of loop him back in um, to that part two. And, and then so I need you to make some clarification. I need to know exactly the attempts. My request that I made weeks ago when I saw this video was I need the attempts that the staff made to reach out to persons of color that sit on the council to be included in the video. That was my first request. My second request was since that time, has any adjustments been made to the video that's been put out there because um, it appears as though the video does not have an accurate representation of persons of color that sit on the board as council members. So this is um, my first time hearing your request. I, I wasn't at the previous meeting. Um, I So for the first video, five total attempts were made. Uh, Self-advocates, there were two. Parent advocates, there were two. State representatives, there were two. And a person of racial minority, there was one. And in terms of people that actually responded back and showed up and came to the scheduled interviewing, that was three. And one self-advocate, one parent advocate, two state representatives, and no person of a racial minority. Um, I'm not sure that it's a good idea for me to share then the names and personal information? I'm not asking for the names of the personal information, um, Marilee, and I won't belabor this point because I know that our chair has to get back on the schedule. I just want to make it known that we had an excellent opportunity to put together a video that can display the um, diversity of persons of color that hold seats on the council. We had a great opportunity to do that. And the video actually was a really good video. I think the work that was behind it was excellent. My biggest concern is that when we say things like meet the council, we're not given an accurate representation of people that are actually out there representing our community. And it's important that 
we ensure that we have self advocates and parent advocates that sit on the council that are of color that would have benefited from being a part of that meeting and being a part of that video. So again, this was a missed opportunity for the council and I am I'm certain that folks may feel um, that I'm always bringing up the diversity issue, but it is a serious problem that we need to address. And so we'll have some more private conversations about it. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair, for allowing me to speak. Thank you, Hyacinth. And Mike, allow me just one moment. Um, yes, sir. Madam Vice Chair, this again, this is Randall Brown, the chair of the DD Council. You and I will definitely be having uh, discussions with the staff on how best to um, rectify and implement uh, better protocols for involvement of all council members, particularly those of color for future uh, videos, as well as whatever O'Neill Communications um, decides to do for the Meet the Council uh, video they plan to redo or add to, as I understand it. So we will definitely be in consultation with the staff on this matter, you and I together. <clears throat> so, uh, Mike, I'm not sure if you have time um, it's fine with me either way, but I did have the contractor here on this meeting um, and she just messaged me that she can speak a little bit to that if you have time. I'm not sure um, if you would like to do that or not. Um, sure, as long as we keep it brief, we can go ahead with that. Okay, uh, so her name's Devika and she's with O'Neill Communications and I think she's a panelist already. So Jessica, um, I'm gonna give it to you. Yes, I don't know if I, um, I'm on camera, but I'm, my camera is on. You're on camera, we see you. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, pleasure to meet everyone. And um, thanks for letting me speak a little bit about it, about this. Um, I, I do apologize if this has created, um, obviously a very important discussion point. I do wanna assure the council that we have definitely heard um, we've definitely made those attempts and we've definitely heard your opinions and your uh, feedback. And we are definitely working on that video. Uh, we are also moving forward on the other one. So the rework on the first one is underway and we are doing a part two to be uh, positioned as um, meet more of our council. So we can definitely add to that conversation and make sure that as um, I apologize, uh, your last name, Hyacinth, I'm not very good at doing uh, first names right away, but I'm sorry, I don't know your last name. Um, as Ms. Hyacinth just said, we wanna be able to show the council exactly in the uh, diversity it offers. So we are working on the part two in reaching out to all and scheduling interviews and doing it as meet more of the council. Cause we know that it's um, one video doesn't say the whole story. So, um, just to let you also know that we are um, also working on the other series as well. So other episodes as well. So um, just, we are in line to do that in our production schedule. So I don't, I don't want you to feel we forgot or we are not paying attention to your great uh, feedback. We are, and we take it very seriously. Um, and so I just wanted to reassure you all that those things will be done um, and are being done and they will be finished and sent to you all for review. Thank you, Demica. Welcome. Um, the third, yeah. And then there's a couple more videos um, after Meet the Council Part Two. And um, I think, so we also worked on creating a form. Part of the trouble was getting people, finding people to participate, finding um, people that had the, information that kind of fell within what the topic was about and getting them to respond and then getting them to show up. Um, so I know Devika is working on a form um, and I know this is something that's been approved higher up than me to share where if you are, if you have someone in mind that you wanna recommend for a video or a particular topic, you can fill out that form and um, we can try to contact that person. 
Thank you, Mary Lee. Welcome. We have any other questions for Mary Lee regarding the video topic? Okay. Um, once again, thank you, Mary Lee. And uh, Ebony, are you available now to give us an update on your initiatives? Yes, sir, I am. Okay, you're um, the floor. Okay, thank you. I'm going to start with Lacan. Um, so just an update on leader positions. There's still currently a vacancy in regions one and 10 for the Lacan leader position. Um, at the January meeting, I reported that there were three applicants, but after reviewing the um, last applicant, the Lacan team decided that they wanted to send out the um, advertisement again so we could get more applicants to choose from just so we could find someone that we felt like would stay on long term as the Lacan leader for regions one and 10. Um, after advertising the um, announcement again and having the FHF centers help us push it out at the end of January, we did have two applicants that applied for the position. Unfortunately, one applicant felt um, that the position wasn't right for her after speaking to two Lacan leaders. And then the other applicant that we had, she never responded to any emails and we didn't have her contact phone number because she didn't submit her resume. So um, until the position is filled, um, members in regions one and 10 will continue to reach out to FHF NOLA um, for more information about Lacan, but we do intend to push out the announcement again um, until we find someone to fill the position. Um, as far as advoca advocacy activities for Lacan, um, the council follows the federal, federal fiscal year, so October 1st through September 30th. And since October 1st, we've had one alert um, and that was sent out on April 9th. And it was again sent out last Friday, which was April 16th. This alert wasn't, it's, it's not reflected in the status report because it was sent out after the status report was due. So as of today, we do have one action alert that's actually still active. Um, and it's gonna remain active until tomorrow, April 20th. So if you haven't taken action yet, you still have time. Um, and then once you take action, you, please make sure that you confirm your action with your Lacan leader. Um, and there are two ways that you can take action. Number one, you can email or call the chair or members of the House Appropriations Committee before the meeting on Wednesday, April 21st. And um, the second way you can um, take action is through email. If you want to email your public comments about the budget, um, you have until tomorrow, Tuesday, April 20th by 1159 to email those um, comments or even your testimony to the email that is um, in the action alert that was sent out on April 9th and again on last Friday, April 16th. Um, the Lacan leaders are also attending BSI meetings virtually at this time um, until the suspension of in-person in activity is lifted. So additionally, we are still hosting our Lacan calls twice a month. Um, and we just wanna make sure that the leaders stay up to date on the council's agenda. And we are now doing bill tracking since the legislative session started on last Monday, April 12th. The Lacan leaders and um, staff have also strategized ways to participate in session while the council still has the suspension of in-person activities. Um, and that information can also be found in Action Alert 1, but just to give you guys some idea of the strategies that we came up with during the calls, um, we are asking members to watch the committee meetings live um, from the legislators, le legislature's website. Um, and when the meeting is in progress, they can see the camera icon and they can click on it. Leaders are there to help their members. If they have any questions about that, if they wanna learn how to log on, Brenton is actually showing it on the screen right now that um, a Senate committee is in progress and you can click on that button right there to view any committee meeting that's going on. 
Um, we also came up with hosting committee watch parties. So the Lacan leaders during committee meetings will start watch parties. Lacan members can start watch parties and they can share with their friends on social media. Um, and then they can tag their friends. They can tag representatives, um, senators and other policymakers like Bessie members. And we've come up with the hashtags, um, hashtag LADDC, hashtag La Ledge and hashtag Lacan. So once they are on social media and they've started their watch parties, they can use those hashtags, tag their friends, and they can post about sharing their personal stories. They can all also email, tweet, and message members of the committee before the committee meeting starts or during the committee meeting. And they can just make sure they share how they're watching. And um, even though they're not there in person, we're still watching virtually about how um, each of the issues that Lacan and the council has on their advocacy agenda is affecting them or their loved ones. And um, just to give, the committee and update the executive committee will be discussing the status of in person of the in person suspension during their meeting this Wednesday, April 21st. And I think that meeting starts at 9am. Um, so they will be discussing the status of the in person suspension. Um, that's all I have on advocacy activities um, Lacan legislative visits. Um, as I stated earlier, the legislative session started April 12th and the Lacan leaders were able to complete a total of 63 formal legislative visits with the legislators. That's about 44% of the legislators they were able to meet with. And um, out of those 63, 39 of those visits were with key legislators. And so they were able to hit 53% of the key legislators before session started. Um, some of the barriers that um, the leaders um, discussed with us during the Lacan call last week was that um, some, legis some legislators did not like um, conducting virtual meetings with the Lacan leaders and members. Um, virtual visits were easier for them to avoid. Um, some legislators just never returned their calls or their emails that they were sending in order to schedule meetings. And some of the strategies were to get um, constituents or Lacan members that are constituents of that legislator to reach out to the legislator themselves, um, make, maybe making it more easier for them to schedule meetings. but. Unfortunately, that was um, not successful as well. So um, the Lacan leaders and members, they'll continue to connect with legislators throughout the legislative session um, via action alerts, informal visits, and using the tactics that I discussed earlier. And then the last update for Lacan will be on member meetings and the round tables that were conducted throughout February and March. Um, the Lacan leaders, in collaboration with the FHF centers, hosted nine virtual roundtables around the state. They started on February 25th with Region 9, and they ended on March 3rd, um, I'm sorry, March 23rd with Region 3. There were a total of 297 participants that attended the um, virtual roundtables, and you can see a breakdown of that number in the status report, but just in case you don't have it in front of you, there were 25 self-advocates, 115 family members, 59 professionals, 73 were unknown or other, only because this was our first time doing virtual roundtables and some of the um, FHF centers conducted them as meetings and um, Unfortunately, you're not able to get the attendance list in a meeting setting um, versus a webinar setting. So some of the centers had, or in some of the leaders had trouble tracking um, the breakdown for those 73 individuals. Um, but we did have 25 policymakers and that includes legislators, legislative aides and our BSE members that attended the round tables. Um, additionally, we have had 10 virtual Lacan member meetings and we've had 63 members at those meetings and um, leaders are just discussing the council's advocacy, 
advocacy agenda um, at those meetings and they're um, educating members on how they can um, participate in session virtually throughout the um, legislative session, which ends in June. So are there any questions for me about Lacan? I don't see any questions, Ebony. Oh, I think Jill may have her hand raised, uh, Mike. I'm sorry. I can Jill. see her. Jill, do you have a question? Oh. Do you know how many do we have the numbers of the people, the respondents, to action alert one as of today? Um, I don't have it in front of me, but that is something that I can get to you, Jill. Um, I could probably just put it in the um, chat. Once I've finished giving my updates, I can go and look for it and okay. get it to you, sure. Okay, thank you. Hey, I just pulled it up, Ebony. Uh, oh. As of Friday, there was 175. Um, but we, so we send it out to our leaders every afternoon, uh, but just not on weekends. So the, the latest number would be as of uh, Friday, there were 175. And then um, I'm sure that number would probably increase by today's end. Thank Any you. other questions? Okay, um, I'll move on to Families Helping Families. Um, Brenton is going to share the chart that I submitted to you all. Well, this is the chart that was submitted to you all um, in the email that Brenton sent. Um, there were some updates that I made based on information that the FHF centers were able to send in. I know North Shore Families Helping Families on your end, they were missing information, but I was able to get that information before the committee meeting on today. So I updated all of that. So this is an updated um, chart for you all, but just to go over some things, um, Families Helping Families does they are on the state federal um, fiscal year. So their fiscal year started July 1st. So they are in their third quarter and the third quarter marks the nine month mark. And so we are hoping that centers are pretty close to meeting all of their deliverables. The only center that has met all of them so far is North Shore Families Open Families. They, are, they have completed all of their deliverables as of the third quarter. Um, the other um, centers, they may have three or four um, that are, that they're working towards, but most of the centers are on track as far as meeting all of the deliverables for um, July or June 30th. Um, there was a typo that I noticed that was in the um, status report. Um, it said that the centers had only completed five outreaches, but that's incorrect. Um, it should have been 55 outreaches, but after I got all of the information from the centers for the um, third quarter, it's actually since October 1st, there have been 132 outreaches. But as you can see on the chart that's in front of you, the outreach is total 259. That's because they're on the state fiscal year. So that was the only um, typo that I saw in the status report. So you guys, um, have updated information on this chart right here. Um, does anybody have any questions about any of the deliverables or any of the information that's in the chart? Hey, just as an FYI, the chart has been updated in the agenda, on the agenda, which is on our website. And also in the chat is the link uh, to this chart since we now have updated information. I have a question. Then, Ebony. Yeah, sure, Jill. When, when did you 
say the state fiscal year ended? The state fiscal year ends June 30th of this year, 2020. So it's July 1st. Like, okay, while well, I have you, the state fiscal year is July to June. Mm-hmm. In the federal fiscal year is October to September, right? Right, that's correct. You got it. Okay, I'm done. Okay. <laughs> Thank y'all. You're welcome. Does anyone else have any questions about FHF? If not, I'll move on to my last um, contract and that's the supported decision-making trainings. Okay. Um, as I stated at the last meeting, the council has contracted with the ARC of Louisiana to offer these statewide trainings um, on supported decision making, also known as the Dustin Gary Act of the 2020 Louisiana Legislative Session. Um, as of April 2021, four trainings have occurred with um, a total of 71 participants in attendance. Um, trainings have been conducted in Region 7, Region 2, and there have been two in Region 5. Um, unfortunately, the training in Region 2 happened like really close to the winter storm that we had in February. So the attendance wasn't as high. They actually had 25 people registered for that training, but only a total of five people um, attended. So they plan on rescheduling the training. Um, for another date for Region 2 so that there are more um, individuals who will be able to um, attend the training. Um, additionally, um, in the contract, the ARC is going to be walking five um, individuals with disabilities through the entire supported decision-making process. Um, currently, they have three self-advocates that are being mentored through the process. Um, there is an upcoming training for Region 9 on May 5th, and that'll be from 1 p.m. to 2.30. And we'll be sharing that on our social media pages. It is also posted on our website um, under the supported decision-making page. So if anyone is interested in registering for that training, you can do so on our website, but we plan to push it out on social media as well. Um, also, I just wanted to let the committee know that I plan on providing a summary report with all of the trainings, with the number of people they've had, also with the feedback that they've gotten back from um, their evaluations, similar to the um, summary that Brenton provides on the training on sexuality and abuse and exploitation. Um, but I'll have that report to you all at the next council meeting in July. So. Does anybody have any questions about supported decision-making? I think Kelly has her hand up, Mike. Yes, go ahead, Kelly. Kelly Monroe, you have the floor. Oh, God, I talked to the Pacific Cable once again. The internet that always sucks, and it never works. Talking that it's always out. Uh, Kelly Monroe? Contour. Huh? I have a contour. It's been a contour. She must not be able to hear us. Talking to your contour? I'm talking about the internet. What internet y'all have? Top? Yeah. Yeah. You live here, you live here. Yeah, I live in Mid City. Where? Mid City. 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 Mid City.
Can you hear us? Yeah, the floor, if you do. I think she's actually on a phone. Hold on, Mike, let me, uh, let's see. Well, she should be able to unmute now. So she called in, but yeah, I mean, the only, I mean, there's only one Kelly that we have and it's not, um, it's unmuted, but I think we, maybe there's a issue on that end. Let's see. I just promoted her, Brenton. Maybe that may, um, promoted her to a panelist that may help the issue. I'm not sure. Her hand is now went down. Or... I think um, I think it's just a technical issue. But I did get uh, I see an update um, that was texted said they're they're updating their registration to include all the demographics. I don't know if that's something that Kelly wanted to chime in about or not, but um... okay, well. For the sake of brevity, uh, we'll uh, go ahead and move along. Um, Ebony, uh, did you have anything else? No, that's it, Mike, unless anybody had any other questions about Lacan or FHS or supported decision making. I'm done. Okay, well, thank you very much. We're gonna move on now to uh, activity 2.73, which deals with establishing pilot programs in multiple regions across the state on first responder tactics, approaches and resources in fostering relationships with and dealing with individuals with developmental disabilities and training for people with individual people with developmental disabilities on how to interact with first responders. Um, in the packet, there were flyers for upcoming training that's happening um, but we also have Duster, Dustin, Ch Dustin Chandler, excuse me, tongue tied today. Dustin Chandler from Interaction Advisory Group with us today, who will briefly share a bit more on what they're working about, working on. Sorry. Go ahead, Dustin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, can everybody hear me? Yes, sir. Uh, uh, can you see me? I've started my video. Yes, sir. Okay, good. Uh, yeah, the, my name is Dustin Chandler uh, with Interaction Advisory Group, uh, obviously here to give you an update on our activities on our initiative. Uh, really appreciate uh, the entire council for giving us this opportunity uh, to work inside Louisiana. Um, we have done a total, uh, we started training uh, first responders and I'm gonna kind of separate these two in the first responder trainings and community trainings. Our first responder trainings uh, which includes law enforcement, medics, uh, therefore, uh, so forth and so on. Uh, we started in February, uh, February 4th, and we decided to do trainings for that the first Feb uh, Thursday, excuse me, of every month. Uh, in February, we had a total of 13 uh, that got trained in February. Uh, March, we had about 20 in one class, and we had the second uh, that had about 20 for a total of 40. Um, and then in April uh, 1st, we had 10 attend our training class. Those were first responders. And I'm going to kind of, I'll go back to how they register for class and how we have filled up these classes and kind of explain how the process works for you guys. Uh, but those are, uh, those are our numbers. On each class, we try to have two self-advocates uh, per training class. Um, and we also try to have a, a self-advocate parent or a parent that can give us a parent's perspective uh, in training if we can uh, in those. And so we have had at least two or three self-advocates and or uh, parental self-advocates in our training. 
which we think is very important to let self-advocates be empowered to uh, talk to first responders um, and give their perspective uh, on these uh, interactions. Uh, how these classes come about is we, we reach out through our resources in Louisiana, through our law enforcement and first responder resources. Uh, we have had excellent, uh, excellent uh, interest in the classes. Every one of our classes have actually filled up. The registration has filled up in all the classes. And as you probably can understand, all these classes will fill up and, you know, weeks go by and then we will have the class and whether they show up to the class or not, obviously, is up to them. That's why we, we open up. We had only 22 spots open. Uh, I talked to uh, Miss Ryland. We decided to bump that up as get as many as we could and try to open 30 spots or right below 30. Um, so we did that for the last uh, two trainings, and we have it all filled up. Then we will have these numbers like 15 per class, 10 per class. Uh, and so... What we are gonna to do to address that of the people who did not show to a class is what we will then do. We will have a list. Um, we'll go back to that roster list from the, the previous months and we will invite them back into the class to kind of fill up the remainder of the dates that we have. We are full in our class. Our rosters are full. Taking a look here, uh, we are full uh, in the May class, which will be May 6th. Uh, and we're we're more than halfway full for the June third class. So I expect us to be full for June, uh, possibly July. Depends on how many did not show up for the uh, first classes that we held. So we will kind of backtrack uh, with these people that signed up, and uh, we will try to get them in a class. Um, and uh, we obviously think the training is important, so we want to make sure those that were interested got the training. So we will reach out to them. Then again, we will fill up the classes. Uh, with those that did not show up when they originally uh, signed up for the class, uh, but it's been a, it's it's been wonderful. We've had Shreveport PD; uh, they've actually requested to train their entire police department uh, from their chief. Um, that's 580. Uh, we are working closely with Bozier Parish uh, Sheriff's Office. Uh, we decided as a company that we would help uh, in the effort in Louisiana. Uh, because we think the training is so important. So we kind of have I've pitched in, so to speak, and we will be training Bozier Parish SO um, on, a, on our, uh, with no extra, obviously, fee to you guys. We're going to train them because they showed a lot of interest up front, uh, and that's going to be training about 420 to 450 deputies over there in Bozier. Uh, we've also had interest from St. Landry's uh, Ambulance Service, uh, Church Point uh, PD, uh, a lot of people wanting to get their entire departments trained. Uh, right now, we are currently budgeted for just one training per month, uh, so it's hard to get to all those numbers. We're getting to as many as we can, um, and we are going to obviously, like I said, we're going to backfill these dates with the people who didn't show the first time and uh, fill up those classes. But that's kind of the interest that we've had uh, in there. I've tried to send on our monthly reports uh, to the DD Council uh, some of the feedback that we do have. We send out a survey if they will take our survey, uh, and we've received um, very good feedback on our classes. So uh, the, it is going really well. Uh, our community trainings, uh, we're having one uh, tonight at 6 p.m. to 7 30. Uh, what we do in our community events is try our best to introduce people to autism, to developmental disabilities, kind of as a whole. Of course, we can't take the whole night and talk about each individual one. Uh, we want to kind of let them know what's helpful if first responders come to their house, uh, pull their car over, uh, whatever they might be uh, involving with a first responder. That could be a medic, that could be a law enforcement officer, uh, could be really anybody in first response. We want them to know the helpful information uh, that they need, uh, obviously, that we train them on, on the information that they need uh, to have a the best possible outcome that they can have about their loved one uh, or about a self-advocate. So we do self-advocate training as well. Uh, we want self-advocates to be prepared uh, to be, you know, be prepared to interact with law enforcement or other first responders. Uh, we think that's very important to let them know what to expect. Uh, because in the in the first responder classes, uh, we are telling law enforcement and first responders, you know, kind of what to expect on that end. So we always look at it as a two-way street in these trainings. Um, 
we want both both communities to understand each other. Uh, we want both uh, communities to uh, know what to expect. Uh, and we want mutual respect between both communities. Uh, and we are big on that. Um, really in our training on the first responder side, we are big on fair treatment uh, and, and really acceptance on that. But we've got to understand that not every instance is the same. And our number one goal in community trainings, but also especially in our first responder trainings, is a safety of the first responder and the individual. Uh, we want the best possible outcome that we can get uh, anytime we have an interaction. We also go over wandering and the action plans that parents can come up with kids that may wander. Uh, no matter what developmental disability it may be, we want parents to understand that wandering can be an issue. Uh, we know it's an issue and it could be at your household. Uh, we give them uh, action plans and ways to help build those action plans uh, in ways also to prevent wandering. We don't want a loss of life if we can help it. Uh, so we go over that. Obviously, the, well, I just went over briefly about the info session for parents and self-advocates. Uh, and then we share about the state resources that we have that we've been given and the ones that we know about. Obviously, Lacan has talked about autism affiliates have uh, really been a helpful, uh, you know, really got engaged with us. We tell about them, partners in policy making and everything that we can as well. And we also share the you know, there is, and I don't know how many people know this, but uh, I, I find that a lot of law enforcement uh, divisions and other first responders uh, don't really know this is out there, but there is, there is within the U.S. Department of Justice, there's a civil rights division, as we all know, and an ADA does address um, law enforcement and pe uh, people with disabilities. So, we give that information out. We show them our website. We make sure that they understand that there are things that cover the way uh, that you're supposed to be interacting um, and get as much training as you can. But we want them to understand that, the, that it is covered under the ADA. Uh, and we share that. And we've got resources on our website uh, that they all have access to to get all the documents that they need uh, about any kind of statewide resource that they may need. And then the um, Department of Justice uh, information as well. So on the first responder side and these community events, the numbers, I will tell you the numbers we, you know, we had, we had only five really in the first yeah. meeting. Uh, tonight we have one. We'll see how many show up. I hate to give numbers before class. Uh, we rely heavily on local uh, groups to help push that information out and try to get them that way. We may have to revisit that with some of the autism affiliates, families helping families to see uh, how we can better push that out uh, within the community and help people understand. I, I mean, we can, you know, everybody can get a flyer, but truly help them understand what the training is about. So uh, we may we be looking into that on how we can boost attendance on the community side. First responder side, there's been no issue uh, with attendance. Uh, our classes are full. Now we've just got to hold them accountable. If you sign up for the class, then we want you to take it. So we'll be going back and uh, touching base with them. So that's kind of a brief update. Uh, if anybody's got any questions, I can give them about our training, about what we go over uh, or anything like that. I'm, I'm open to questions. Yes, uh, Dustin, there is one question in the chat. Yeah. Um, is there any Region 9 or e Region 1 outreach for first responder training? And I, is, is when we talk about regions, help me understand regions. Are we talking about uh, family helping families regions? Yes. Okay. Uh, the, we have reached out to all the, uh, the FH, uh, uh, the family helping families regions. We have gotten a little support, uh, you know, from all of them. Uh, uh, let me, let me rephrase that. We have gotten little support around the state. The most support we've gotten is actually from Region 7. Um, I, we really don't know why that is. We are going to make an, a, more of an effort to make sure our information is actually being read via email uh, and possibly follow those up with phone calls. Uh, we have also, we would love to uh, have a real good connection with uh, People First Louisiana. We've reached out to them, haven't really gotten uh, really engaged with them. We'd like to, and we're going to continue those efforts. So the question about Region 9 and Region 1, there has not been much as in, you know, back and forth between us and Region 9 and Region 1. I can tell you, looking at the map and looking at the people that have been in our trainings, we're getting a pretty good spread across Louisiana uh, in the first response uh, communities. 
Um, I will also say, I believe it's Attorney General Landry in Louisiana. We have had several come through the, the AG's office uh, that deal with uh, child uh, crimes and exploitation. Uh, they have, a lot of them have come through. So the AG's office has really uh, taken advantage of our training as well. So we've really been all across the state. Um, I, I mean, I could give you a whole long list of departments that we've actually been training in, uh, but that may take up the whole rest of the meeting. So specifically region nine and region one, we will double our efforts to get in touch with them again to help push that out because that's that's really where it starts really to, to help you really how we designed this many years ago is to have the first responder training take place and then on the tails of that have community event because like i said earlier we think it's a two-way training street uh, we want everybody to be and it's, it's part about building community and understanding of each other especially uh, with families like mine and having law enforcement first responders understand that. Uh, so it's kind of a two-way thing. We, I want to also mention, we are also planning, hopefully, if, if, you know, and this is pandemic pending, I guess we can say, uh, looking at the pandemic and all the information coming into us, uh, coming into everybody in Louisiana, we hope to have at least one in-person visit to the state of Louisiana and have a really big uh, law enforcement first responder training and then work with the local affiliates there to have a, a big community event as we are in person, because that is really where we got our start. We shifted to virtual. We do virtual all the time now, obviously, but we like to come in and do those big, uh, big events where we have a lot of attendees in person. If the uh, if everybody feels safe with that, we're going to address that and try to do that uh, toward the end uh, or towards September uh, if we feel safe with that. And that obviously depends on the information that we have about the pandemic. Okay, um, Dustin, um, I have a couple of other comments, but uh, I think um, if you could share your contact information, so some of these may may be able to reach out to you for the, the information. That the yeah, you want? You, do you want me to type my email in the chat, sir? That would be great, yes. Okay. Yeah, and I'll tell everybody, we would love to have any help that we can get to help spread this message to every group, um, self-advocate groups that want to work with us in training. Obviously, as you guys well know, we are budgeted to pay them. Uh, we want them to be engaged, and that's, and that's really through all spectrums uh, of disability. It, it doesn't have to be autism. It doesn't have to be uh, any particular one. We know we already know of instances um, – of uh, you know individuals unfortunately that are deaf that have lost their lives uh, dealing with law enforcement. So we want uh, really anybody. So that's across the spectrum of disability. And then any parents or actually anybody from any group that wants to share information either with community, uh, with first responders. It is a. I know this to be. I'm former law enforcement, and law enforcement has the information that they have. And that's great, but we like to bring in information that they may not have. Uh, so if anybody is having trouble getting their information to police departments or sheriff's offices or fire departments, uh, we would love to help facilitate getting that information from you uh, and into them. And we can post that up on our website if we need to. If we see fit, we can get it that way or we can make sure that they're getting it via email as well, because it is a, it truly is uh, about getting the information to them. We know a lot of times that law enforcement and medics and those that are working in first response are oftentimes the ones uh, that, that really discover people that maybe need services. Um, and if we can just get them and those families that may need services and those services are available in Louisiana, we want to help them connect the dots. And oftentimes first response can help us do that. So that's a, that's a big thing to us. So if anybody needs help in doing that, feel free to send me an email. Uh, if you're interested in or have a loved one interested in participating or your organization. And then we really need help again, like I said, on the community events, uh, really pushing that out to the community to come, you know, learn because we want to also help facilitate learning about your organizations in the community. Uh, but then also get them the information. We, we know wandering is a deadly issue. Uh, and we just want that. I mean, we, I, losing lives is, is um, 
Uh, it's tragic, obviously, and that's what we're trying to avoid in all of our training uh, as best possible outcomes on the community side. Some parents, we in our first training, a parent had a 10-year-old, uh, then she did not know that really wandering was a big issue in autism. Uh, and, uh, and it is. Uh, drowning is a leading cause of death in autism. And so we want the parents to know that. So please send me y'all's information. I will send you everything that I have on any event that we have coming up, including the first responder events. Uh, people always ask, how can they get involved in that? It is really as simple as sending your local sheriff's office, police department, fire department, whomever you have contact information with. Uh, it is really just as simple as sending them an email telling them when the training is and then giving them my email address and say, all you have to do is email. We try to make it simple. Just email us. We'll register you for the class and then we'll be up to date on when their class takes place. And that may have had more questions on here and I may have skipped them and I apologize. Yeah, there's some information in the chat. Um, the, the question about regions one and nine were specific to uh, New Orleans, Jefferson and St. Tammany parishes. Um, it was mentioned uh, chiefs of police, superintendents and sheriffs in, the, in those areas. There's a high population, particularly people of color, and they engage in interactions with law enforcement. Uh, and that comes from um, our vice chair, Hyseth McKee. So she was just yeah. saying, please let us know the steps that you have made, mm -hmm. uh, I guess, to engage those individuals. And she was saying that that discussion can be held offline for the sake of time. Yeah. Um, there were also comments from uh, Susan Reen. She's our uh, Families Helping Families Director in Region 5. So that's the southwest corner of the Lake Charles area. Uh, and she mentioned that, um, you know, she asked who from your office has reached out because she hasn't heard about this information. And I think yeah. she included her contact information in there as well. Yeah. Uh, because they can certainly, I don't know why they haven't received the information. Yeah, uh, well, and I may have some explanation. You know, this was early on. We may have bad email addresses. And I, I would love if some, if ever all the, if everybody could just send me some contact info just to that email address and we will, uh, we will, I will have my assistant get back on it to make sure we have good contact info. I know that was true for the, some of the other affiliates we were working with. We just didn't have real good contact info. Uh, but if, if you'll send us updated contact info, we will put you on a distribution list to know when every when every single first responder takes place. And that's first Thursday of every month. And when the community events and we'll send you our flyers, we can add things to the uh, anything uh, to the classes, obviously information that y'all want to get out. So we just need good updated contacts. So we will make sure that and I will have my assistant. I'm pretty sure she's listening. Uh, we will make sure that we have those contact information. Uh, to get out to you guys uh, all this information that we have coming up and i will tell you too where where there could be a big effort and we uh, i would like to see this really everywhere that we go um, we also know that there's school resource officers uh, as well uh, school resource officers during the school year oftentimes don't attend trainings because they're obviously in the schools we're, you know, it, and that's that's always been a little bit of a uh, an area that really needs to be touched, I believe. And that's my own personal opinion that SROs need to be more involved. So in reaching out, we always ask SROs to be involved because they're dealing with children every day uh, and we want them to have the best interactions with them as well. So um, and let y'all know how our company works. We work. We have an advisory board. Uh, and I encourage y'all to visit our website, interactionadvisorygroup.com, and check out our advisory board. So we've got, uh, you know, psychologists on our advisory board. We also have self-advocates on our advisory board, parents. And so we always collaborate with them at least once a quarter uh, to get the information that's on their mind, uh, make sure we can get that in training and all that. So it's not just me uh, saying what I think you need to hear. It comes from self-advocates, parents, law enforcement, first responders, psychologists, and all as a whole uh, to make sure that we're doing that. Thank you, Dustin. Um, Jill Hanno, you have a question? I'm pretty sure I can answer this myself, but just to verify, when you say community training, you're meaning self-advocates and parents 
or rather self-advocate and parents fall under the community training, correct? Yeah, so when we refer to community, we really mean any interested community member that wants to learn about it. But we also, yes, we do mean self-advocates and their parents because uh, we have a section in there specifically for them. Uh, but we also talk about any community member that really wants to know and understand about uh, really our world and developmental disability. Uh, and I say our world because my family is a part of that. We want them to know. So it's really a community as a whole, but that does include, yes, uh, self-advocates and uh, their parents. Because like I said, we have a specific section in there just for self-advocates and parents. Um, and we want parents to know that if they have a loved one uh, with a developmental disability or, uh, or whatnot, we want them to know what information does first responders need when they show up on scene to, to make sure that that scene is help kept, kept safe uh, and, and, they can, they, and that they can also really serve that family to the best that they can and, and for the best outcome. And I can tell you a lot of times that information is missed. Um, a, a lot of times they, some times they just don't know uh, but if we can get the communication going from parents, self-advocates to police, but then also, like I said, two-way training street, once first responders obtain this information, then how do we proceed with adjusting our response to what it is that we're dealing with, uh, assess the situation? And we always ask them always to choose the path of more safety uh, and they get to a disposition, but we want them to be safe. Uh, and we know that caregivers, parents, and self-advocates can be a very big part of that uh, if we have that level of understanding between the two groups. Perfect. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Do we have any other questions for Dustin before we move on? Okay. Thank you, Dustin. That's very informative. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Yeah, thank you. And I want to say thank you again for everything that y'all do. Uh, and thank you for giving us the opportunity. Thank you very much, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, uh, Brenton, will you give us an update on the remaining initiatives, please? Yeah, so before I move on to the last initiative, which is the the trainings for abuse and exploitation. I think we have uh, Mr. David Whalen here with us from Niagara University, and he can share a little bit about um, what his group is doing uh, for a training program on emergency preparedness and response. That is activity 2.7.4, I believe, page 12 of your status report. Uh, so Mr. Whalen, if you're on, if you wanna unmute and um, we, we can give you a moment as well to share about uh, what your group is doing on this activity. That's good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for having me. Uh, we're excited to bring this into Louisiana. Ironically, we're getting funded by the Nebraska Council on Development Disabilities at the same time for the same grant. This is our first step out of New York with the emergency management. We're, our first responder program is in five states, but this is our first step into uh, your state and other states with this. So it's always an adventure when we uh, come into the state. Um, you have, you have and should have seen the reports. I see up here that this is our upcoming uh, trainings. Uh, we're very excited that these both these trainings uh, filled up, sold out at 100 per program. Uh, so the what was it initially a slow response, uh, and I still get some slow responses as far as outreach and meeting with people and key players. Uh, the first one we did here actually had 55. That was the March 30th one. Some of you may have attended. Uh, we had 22 a 10, 55 registered. So we have the numbers that are pretty consistent with virtual training with us across this, the country and our other programs, again, mainly in first response in South Dakota, Missouri, and New York. Uh, so we are, uh, again, excited to have this. This is an introduction program to it. It certainly has valuable content. We're introducing what will be a preload to the full program. What we will be doing in, uh, and I will tell you the tentative dates. So please don't set your calendar yet for it, but uh, as we, as you are well aware, we're scheduled to do 12 virtual trainings. We're going to be doing 13, uh, three of the intros as opposed to two. And again, with the demand, we uh, maybe should even consider doing another one to beyond our, our contract. Uh, certainly uh, doesn't matter to us from that standpoint. But what we're going to be doing is a part two and part three uh, virtually. The 
and they will complement what's been done in the introduction here. Uh, there'll be a slant towards part two with the emergency managers and people who have responsibility in that, although all are encouraged to attend. Part three will be more of a slant towards people with disabilities, although they're all designed to be together. Let me take a step back here. Uh, we do a lot of disability awareness trainings. All of our programs are customized for that audience. So for instance, our firefighter EMS law enforcement 911 is all customized for those audience and those attendees. This is one of our two programs that's custom, that is designed for an eclectic audience. The intent of this program is inclusive planning and active participation. So the end product is that people with disabilities are having a say in the planning and preparedness process. Uh, we've effectively done this in New York State uh, to the point where our what we call core advisory group, one of our end objectives, a FEMA concept, is that people with disabilities are actively working with, we call it counties in the state, or counties or parishes in your state, working within the parishes where they're part of it, part of it included in the planning process. And ideally, if we get granted for a year or two, what our objective is, is to come and do this live. If you can see this, this is the active, this is the inclusive planning and active participation manual that all attendees will walk out with. And we designed this program in a twofold manner where the two day full in-person program uh, will be, uh, is done for people who are stakeholders to have responsibilities in this particular uh, field, our agency organiz organizers, be it the disability community, uh, support groups. Uh, for instance, I've met, if you're familiar with the Drake Mamas in your state, I've been working with them for a few years and in, in years past. Um, individuals along those lines. The afternoon session of day two then brings in people who don't have as much role in, in say, organizational oversight, but uh, people who are interested and will certainly play a role in active planning and participation. And that has in the years past included uh, self-advocates, parents of people with disabilities, uh, people in emergency management who don't have as, uh, as heightened a role in, say, their oversight of the Department of Health or uh, other key areas along those lines. So the intent is that everyone is advising. And what we have done is with our past uh, involvement with FEMA at the Office of Disability Integration and Coordination, uh, developed the content that is both specific from FEMA that was never actually in the years past uh, displayed. I was fortunate to be one of 30 people that was trained in how to do access and functional needs training for FEMA, but they never deployed us to train. So the content that FEMA developed in, in conjunction with the uh, programs that we have developed over the years with our uh, involvement, I've been involved with this topic for 15 years extensively, uh, are again in, intended to bring everyone together to, to plan and, and pair uh, intermittently. I do ask you, I put in the chat box, I do ask you to go to our first responder and emergency management uh, website, uh, frdat.niagara.edu, again in the website. I put my email as well. Uh, one of the objectives we've been working on is reaching out to several key players in your state that have roles in, in uh, disability functions, as well as uh, emergency management. Was, and Julie, I heard Julie Hagen Foster talking earlier. I see Michelle still on this call. Uh, we, with Michelle, we still would like to meet Kelly as well. Kelly and I might be meeting this week. Uh, we've met with some, uh, the Independent Living Center uh, folks, uh, Yvanka and Alicia, uh, and Bambi, uh, Jessica Lewis. We've gotten a call back already from the uh, New Orleans, Louisiana, ready to discuss uh, things that they can do to build in their program specific to this topic. And that's what our function is, folks. It's not just to, to train, it's to, it's to work with and, and bring our programs and our, our areas of expertise together. Uh, but I will say this, there's no set expert in this topic. It is eclectic, our audience, and when we train uh, in person, everyone speaks. I'm not the lone speaker. People in with topic areas and, and areas of... Uh, responsibilities across both both factions uh, speak. Uh, so I, again, our intention is uh, total inclusion and active participation of the disability community. And we've seen that highly successful uh, in several states, each place does it a little, each state does it a little differently. Uh, and that's part of a uh, crack in the seal. And again, working, working with, um, working with folks like yourself, this is, this is a, key piece. We have uh, some really strong relationships with councils across the states, especially the ones we've been in, again, mainly for first response. Uh, but uh, um, with the council role, uh, feel free to provide input 
uh, as far as um, what we're looking to do and outreach to. I'll take a pause and take some questions. Do we have any questions for uh, Mr. Whalen? I don't see anything, Mike. I, I don't see any hands raised or anything in the chat. All right. Well, thank you much, sir. Very welcome. Thank you, everyone. Look forward to working with you. Thank you. Britton, you want to uh, continue? Sure. Uh, so for the, our last activity here, it's a 2.9.1. Um, left my, there we go. Um, and so this, this, if you're looking at your status of planned activities, it's on page 15. Uh, and so just a little background, uh, the council this year, they're, they've contracted again with Team Dynamics to work on this initiative. And we've actually been contracting with them, I think since uh, fiscal year 19 or yeah, 19. Cause I think October, 2018 was their first time uh, they started doing trainings on this for us. And so their training has kind of evolved over the years, but for the most part, you know, they really focus uh, in this initiative to ensure that our individuals with disabilities and their caregivers are getting the information that they need about healthy and unhealthy relationships, sexuality and ways that they can identify abuse and exploitation. And hopefully by having a strong understanding and comprehension of those areas, uh, they'll be able to prevent further uh, or maybe not just further, but any abuse or exploitation that they might encounter. Uh, and so like everything else that we've been doing with our initiatives, things right now are hosted online via webinars rather than in person. Um, so uh, right now, if I think on my screen, if I can get back to my shared screen here, uh, you see in your, your packets, there was this kind of breakdown of what's been done thus far for the trainings. Um, so if we check out on this first page, so far we've had 14 individuals with disabilities that participated in the trainings. And there have been 46 people um, that were either family members or caregivers. Um, one thing I wanted to point out, typically whenever we see, um, so the other feedback in, the, in this document, for those, this is your first time that's seeing it, we kind of break down some of the information that is provided in the, the surveys or the feedback that uh, the contractor gets. And so usually whenever we see uh, kind of very consistent, just loner, strongly disagree here. Typically, that's uh, just a mistake in the survey. I don't know if that's accurate or not because the that particular survey, I, you know, I don't, I don't know who provides that information. But I would venture to say this is probably not a strongly disagree because there really hasn't been any super negative feedback that would indicate that, um, you know, someone had a really bad experience with this training. Uh, but for the most part, as you can tell, overall, I mean, the, the training has been very successful. Uh, a lot of people have provided feedback, which we kind of summarize the information here. We don't put down every single piece of feedback that's given um, just because, you know, trying to condense the information that, that you get from, from the invoices. Uh, so this kind of gives you an idea of some of the inf information that has been shared with the contractor as far as what they're doing well. Uh, and what they're what they could improve upon, uh, and so if you scroll through, uh, or if you did have a, a packet in your hands, if you look at all the the I think it's the second and third pages, that's going to let you know about the trainings that have happened, as well as uh, our registration and attendance. So sometimes uh, those numbers are a little bit off. You'll have more people that register than actually attend. Um, but I do know, um, probably not in every circumstance, but some individuals, if they, they do miss one of the trainings, they tend to sign up for another one. Um, also linked in this document, if you are interested in attending this training, uh, all the information about this is in our website, but you also have it here in your packet where you can click on uh, whichever link applies to you and register for the next training that's coming up. Uh, so we do have trainings that are scheduled through the end uh, of this fiscal year or the federal fiscal year, so through September. Um, and again, the, this training that occurred on April 19th or April 9th, I haven't got the invoice yet, so I can't give you an idea of how many actually attended that training. 
but in general, uh, you know, they've, they've gotten great feedback. And I think, um, again, as with previous years, it's been a very successful initiative thus far. So any questions about this particular initiative? Don't see any. All right, I will. Um, I'll turn it back over to you, Mike. Oh, there we go. Thank you, uh, Britton. Eagle. I think you got muted, Mike. There yeah, you go. I did. Sorry, I got uh, I got muted as well. Um, so um, I don't have any announcements. Uh, if anyone on staff has any announcements for today, if you uh, could jump right in with them, if you like. I don't have any announcements, but a couple of things that I'll send over to the committee. I'll also link it in the committee summary whenever that becomes available. Um, Shortly before the meeting, we got the update uh, that the partners coordinator sent, so I can share that with you. Uh, and then I'll also share, I think um, Jill Hano had asked for it, that summary about the OCDD um, visual services work group. Um, Julie forwarded that over, so I'll send that to you guys as well. Uh, and I'll also link that in the, the summary. Oh, it looks like um, maybe Julie has something. I see in the chat, she forgot to mention one thing. Julie, you still there with us? Yeah, I am. Is it okay if I do a quick announcement? I forgot. Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. So I sent this to you as well, Brenton, if you could get out and uh, Courtney too. We are sponsoring, the department is sponsoring a, um, uh, that we've been doing different panels. Uh, it's called vaccination or uh, COVID-19 vaccination panels. And we've had targeted efforts at different um, specific populations. One of those uh, we've had, and we've had a lot of success. We had um, one with the, for the African-American community, one for the uh, Latino and Hispanic community is coming up. Uh, one with the Divine Nine. We've had a faith-based initiative. And so on April the 23rd from 1.30 to 2.30, um, this panel to talk about vaccination is going to be focused on the disability community and the providers um, who support uh, folks in the disability community. Um, and we've got a really great panel uh, ready to kind of talk and tell folks their stories um, and why they would want to encourage folks to go uh, to get the COVID-19 um, vaccinated. Thanks, Brenton. There you go. There's our flyer. So we'll be sharing that and um, and just encourage folks to listen and to help us get the word out there too. We think it's a very important um, conversation to be had right now. So thanks for, for sorry, I forgot that earlier. Oh, thank you, Julie. Um, does anyone else have any other announcements to make? Okay, hearing none, um, do I have a motion to adjourn? I, I, anyone have a motion to adjourn? Say, so Mike, you don't need a motion as long as nobody objects, you're good to go. Any objection to adjourn? Objur objection to adjourning. Say that five times fast. Yeah. Um, so uh, I appreciate everybody showing up today, being uh, being here today. Uh, I know it's a busy week uh, with meetings, and I appreciate your time and uh, being here today. And uh, look forward to seeing y'all later this week. Thank y'all. Bye bye.